and I'll turn on the screens and we'll go. All right, so welcome to week 11. Um, today the lecture is actually a little bit shorter, yay. So it's only 27 slides, not 50,000. Um, that being said, there are actually two pretty important topics and the reason the slides are a little shorter and topics are a little shorter is I'm introducing assignment two this week. And you know, that goes with everything else. Um, so after I'm done today's lecture, I'll be talking about assignment two and the rules of engagement and all that jazz. Okay, so without further ado, Yes? No? Good. So, I also bought myself the world's cheapest clicker. So I don't need to keep walking back and forth to my laptop while I'm talking. It's amazing what you can get on Amazon for 14 bucks. <laughs> they used to be like a hundred and something dollars. Mind you, some brand that I have no idea what it is. And I'm 99% sure I know where it came from. As can most of the students in this room. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. If it works, good enough. All right, so today's topic is uh, we're going to talk about ordering records. And we are also going to talk about aggregate functions. Um, ordering is a very simple concept up front. It won't take long for me to explain it. I will demo it. That will take all of two minutes, literally, uh, at least the demo part. So. If you are ordering your records, that means you're trying to sort the order the records come out in. Um, you don't always want everything to come out in the natural order that's in the database because that's not always useful. At times you'll want it to come out in a different order, like most recent first or oldest first, uh, sorted alphabetically by name. Uh, maybe you want to sort by totals, that kind of thing. So the SQL command to sort your, the results of your select statement is order by. And you can sort ascending or descending order. Uh, for those of you that don't know what ascending and descending means, ascending means from smallest to biggest, and descending means from biggest to smallest. I'm just going to make sure that everybody understands that terminology clearly so there's no miscommunications on what you know, ascending and descending means. And you can also sort by multiple fields by using a comma. And you separate the order by field one, comma, field two, comma, field three. And the way the sort will go is it'll sort completely by field one, subsort by field two within the previous sort, and then field three, four, five. So as you sort down by um, different uh, fields, it's just changing the sort order first by the big one, so if you, let's say you're sorting by countries and you decide, you know, Canada comes up first and then you've got, you know, United States and, you know, United UK, and inside of that then you sort by province, then it would sort alphabetically, you know, Alberta, blah, 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 A to Y, but it would always be ca fully list of Canada first and then, you know, the provinces or territories. And basically it looks like this, select star from, in this case, order items, order by order number, and it will literally sort um, in ascending order. So, but that's the default, by the way. If you do an order by and you don't tell it what order, what direction to sort in, it'll always be ascending from smallest to biggest. Wow. If I want to sort by more than one column, and I can even change the sort order. So you can go select star from order items, order by. In this case, we're sorting by price descending, so our biggest price to smallest price, and then by order number ascending. So it'll go, what was the most expensive item? And then it'll sort in order, one, two, whatever, for the order number. All right, so I'm going to do the demo on the ordering so that you have 
a functional version of this. All right. I did manage to get my grid a little bit bigger for you guys, so it's not as bad as it was for seeing the results. Okay, so if I go, um, order by name, and I'm going to sort ascending, you will see that it starts with A, so Aero Special, Augusta, and then Airbus. Now, if I were to tell it to sort by a second category, which would be the description, and I can tell that one to sort in descending order, and that's not going to work because, there we go, that's better, like such. Now you can see, if you look at Airbus is a good example where it starts with A380F, because alphabetically, A 380F for Airbus is the last one they have. And the sort, as you can probably expect, starts with the first letter. Once that one's fully sorted, it'll do the second letter, third letter, so it's not that mis mysterious. And to show you guys that, yes, these last, these um, sort order changers, effectors will do it. Now you can see that Airbus now sorts A300 first instead of A380. That's all there is to sorting. It's really not that complicated. And by the way, this will work with numbers. It works with letters. Technically, so sort um, on Booleans if the system supports Booleans. Since MySQL only has in a integers for Booleans, obviously we're sorting on numbers, and that's cool. Um, the only thing where it gets a little weird is on um, nulls. Depending on the database engine, the nulls will be sorted first or last. But they will not be s intermixed with everything else because technically in this case, a null is a value because it's the absence of value, so they'll all be grouped together. But depending on, like I said, the database engine you're using, might come in first, might come in last. Who knows? Actually, let me just do a quick look in airports, because I know there's an airport with something that's null. There we go. Um, so, empty will sort before letters. And then I'm going to modify it to do ICAO. And MySQL sorts nulls first. So it goes, at least as far as MySQL is concerned, it'll go null, empty, and then everything else the normal way. If this was Postgres, the nulls would be at the end. Different database engine treats nulls slightly differently. OK, so that's, that's our topic of ordering. So the next one is, uh, if you've got multiple conditionals, and basically we use uh, parentheses. I don't know why this says brackets, but they're parentheses. For those of you, don't, of you that don't know what the difference is, parentheses are circular, brackets are the square ones. And then you've got the curlies, which I don't remember what they're called. Um, I just call them curlies. Now. The order of operation is and, or, and not in that order. So if you've got and and or in the same query, the ands will always get resolved before the ors do. If you actually want to uh, make sure that certain things are operated a certain way, you'll put parentheses around it. So then it'll resolve what's in the parentheses first and then everything on the outside, just like a typical math equation. So. The AND operator, I think I actually demonstrated this last week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on AND. Um, I did spend time on AND last week, didn't I? Yeah? A little bit? Well, there's, there isn't much more to it than what they did last week. So you've got AND, which basically says both predicates must be true for it to be valid. So in this case, we're grabbing everything from SKU data, where the department is water sports and the buyer is Nancy Mayers. And 
basically put, it'll sort, search through all the records and find where both those conditions are true. And that means the list will get smaller. If I do an or, again, if it's one or the other is true, but not, you know, if they're both true, that's good too, because technically that's or. But it's one or the other. And ors is where a lot of beginners get um, caught with their pants down. Because they'll put in a one condition, then they'll slap in an or because they're not getting everything they want. They put in another condition, then they suddenly get everything. Um, and I'll demonstrate that one in just a minute. It's an easy one to demonstrate. Um, not negates. So that would, if I were to do uh, select star from skew data with the department is water sports and not buyer equals Nancy Meyer, it would give you, um, it's, and it's the wrong screenshot. It would give you everything that's not Nancy Meyer. And by the way, please don't ever write it like that. It's really hard to read. I'd prefer if you went where department equal to water sport and buyer not equal to Nancy Meyer. It's going to be the exact same thing and way easier to understand than how that is written. I will demonstrate a way better way of why you're, where you use not. Okay. Demo time. All right, so. Oh, my skill being special. Time zone is zero. It's an integer, but it's actually decided to interpret my quote marks as something valid. Um, if I did that against another database server, it would tell me I'm an idiot. It's time zone name. All right, so here's America, New York. Um, and now if I wanted to put in an and in here, Absolute city. So this will give me everything in the time zone of New York and the city is Orlando. As you can see, the list gets smaller and smaller because I'm filtering it down more. Um, if I were to change this to an or, Uh, that's not how you spell Vancouver. Now we're, we're having an or. So it gave me everything that is in America, New York time zone and, well, in this case, or the city is equal to Vancouver. So what it's doing is it's saying anything that matches condition one or anything that matches condition two. If it just so happens that both conditions are true, it's still true. So it's just like in Java when you're learning about your if statements where you learned about or, same idea, absolute same idea. So now what we could do is put in or city, actually I'm gonna go city is equal to um, All right, so now I grabbed Winnipeg in there too. So what the rule is saying now is give me anything where the time zone is equal to this or the city is equal to that or the city is equal to this. Um, in theory, if I want to start putting in some basic rules where I want certain things to resolve first, although this won't make a difference, but I'm going to put it in just to make it clear. What it would do is it would resolve cities equal to Vancouver or cities equal to Winnipeg first and then the other one. So this will work and do the exact same result. This again will not work. 
And the reason it doesn't work is that Vancouver, neither Vancouver nor Winnipeg are in New York. Even though we have an or happening where the city is equal to this or that, the fact is that I'm trying to make it match with something that doesn't match, it returns with nothing. Um, And in a second here, we're going to have one of those fallacy moments where I was talking about where people shoot themselves in the foot with the oar. As you can see, right there, got a 42, a 13, and an 8. Because here I asked for greater than 100 and less than 200. But that's not what I asked for. I said oar. So it's telling me, give me everything that's more than 100, 100. And I also want everything that's less than 200. So that means it would include anything less than 100. Because it's less than 200. This is where you want the and to happen, in there. So I can go and in here. And now it'll just give me the airports in that time zone where the elevation is between 100, well, 101 to 249. Um, I can also turn it around and make this into an or. What it'll do is it'll resolve. Really? Come on. It'll resolve the brackets first and then do the or. So it'll give me any airport that's between 100 and 200 or anything that's in that time zone. So that's pretty much the combination of everything you can do with these in a digestible format. And as you can see, there's, you know, everything you, literally, everything that has that elevation. So if I were to go to the end of the result, we're going to have some New Yorks mixed into here, and we're going to have all kinds of other stuff. So there'll be some New Yorks that are, nope, that went too fast. I can guarantee somewhere in here, there you go, there's an 80. So the or is allowing things that are outside that elevation to happen because it's saying, give me anything that's in New York or anything that's inside this range. Yes. I can do for the top part. The bottom part's not going to get much bigger. Okay. So yeah, so that says, you know, that covers pretty much every example of what I just spoke about so far today, minus the ordering. Uh, if I want to throw in an order on this, I can. And now it's sorting and our nulls came up first and then it's going down alphabetical in the time zone and then it'll sort by city. So that's a basically an everything in one that I've talked about so far today. They're good examples to have at hand. And I actually will make a point to I'll post that as part of the announcement. Okay. So back to PowerPoint. So that takes care of ordering, that takes care of your parentheses in your where clause. Honestly, you can just think of the where clause as a giant filter that follows basically the same logic as if statements in Java. The syntax is different, but the way it executes is the same. All right, so the next one I'm going to talk about is uh, the aggregate functions. Aggregate functions is math. How many of you have used Excel? How many of you actually used Excel properly? And had it actually do math for you and not just have a little list of, you know, oh, I think I'm going to export my list of uh, manga I read in the last six years into Excel because, you know, mal isn't good enough. 
whatever. Spreadsheets have a lot of math functionality built into it. Um, some people might be really surprised just how much you can do with a spreadsheet. And then some people are really shocked what you can do with SQL. So the aggregate functions I have up on the screen right now are the most commonly used. Depending on your database engine, there will be more available to you. Uh, Postgres actually has statistics aggregate functions where you can ask for mean deviations and outlying percentages by feeding it a couple of pieces of info. It'll just do it for you. Um, but the most common ones you'll find everywhere is count. In other words, the two different ways of doing count, and I'll demonstrate those. Um, sum, average, min, and max. So count is pretty obvious. One, two, three, four, five, it just counts. Basically put everything after it's done doing the where clause, whatever comes back after you've excluded the rows, that will be your count. Sum adds up the numeric values in a column. So that's this is where I was coming back to Excel, where you know you have numbers going down a column and at the end you'll put in a sum. The sum adds up everything above it. That's what sum does. It summarizes a column for you and adds them up. Uh, average. Same idea as sum, except it does the average. I've had students where they're saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna figure out the average, so they'd actually do sum of column divided by the count of the column. And that does an average, or they could have just used the average function and saved themselves, you know, potentially weird math. Uh, min and max, maximum value, minimum value. I think that's self -self, also self-explanatory. Um, so essentially it lets you add up or find the average or that kind of stuff. And it'll output. Uh, a lot of functions operate on a single row, um, which sounds kind of weird when I say that, but basically it takes each row individually and takes the values from that and then does the aggregate. Um, and so the aggregate is really meant for multiple rows, whereas a string function such as upper, lower uh, operates on a single column. So if we're going to do a sum from the example table that's included in the textbook, select sum of order table as order sum from retail order, and that'll give you a single number. And this is where I warn that MySQL is extra special. Um, when I, I'm going to demonstrate this, after I'm done talking about the different aggregate functions. But MySQL allows you to do certain things you're not supposed to be able to do. Um, if you do a sum and you also have a display column, but you don't do a proper group grouping for it, it'll just grab the first value and add everything into that, making it a, giving you a total, yes, but not a valid total. I'll demonstrate that in a minute and you'll also understand what I mean when you see it. And well, I think these two are pretty much the same. Um, if you don't put an alias on the, uh, the aggregate, depending on the database server, it'll either make up a name for you or it will just give it a no name. Like in MySQL, it'll go no name. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server, I believe, also says no name. Postgres, it returns it as literally the name of the column is the name of the function. So the column would be called sum. You can also run multiple aggregates at the same time. So you can figure out the sum, the average, the min, and the max in one go. So these are basically what you'd call aggregates run in parallel. In other words, each one is run individually. And well, there's count. I'm going to demonstrate count in a bit. Now, this is an important one. Remember last week and I talked about distinct? So if you want to count the distinct values of something, you have to put the keyword distinct inside the aggregate function, not on the outside. Why? Because if you put it on the outside, it'll look at the distinct values for the entire row of data. If you put it on the inside, 
it looks at the distinct values for that column, which is a very different thing than the distinct value of the entire row versus the distinct value of a single column. I know for some people that may sound like I'm saying the same thing twice, but it's not. Um, that I'll be able to demonstrate also in a minute. Um, so there are a few limitations. If you were to write a query like this, select department comma count from SKU data, any database server except MySQL will give you an error. Uh, the error you see there is one from um, Microsoft SQL Server. Postgres will tell you that you have, it'll give you a different error message. MySQL, on the other hand, will just go, a dir. I guess you just want me to give you the total and just get pick, it'll pick the very first value for department it finds and add everything up to department. Thus, you can happily shoot yourself in the foot because you didn't pay attention. What you're supposed to do is the group by, and um, of course that's not what this slide's about. All right, so I'm actually going to talk about this one in a bit, and I'll, I'll come back to it. So I'm going to go by, um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to demonstrate the aggregates first. So we've seen this before. What I can do is go uh, count star. So that's going to count the total of number of rows. Not super complicated concept. So I can also go um, min elevation max elevation average elevation and now I've got three separate values it ran all three aggregates fantastic now this is where MySQL is stupid so this is the one that I just showed you guys on the slide that would should generate an error in anything else but MySQL this will give you an error message MySQL, on the other hand, goes, bruh, I got you. You must want the very first value in the database, and we're just going to add everything up and just display that. Why? Why would anybody think that's a good idea to allow a database engine to do that? So, and I'll be talking about the group by clause in a minute, but I figured this is the right spot to introduce it. Group by allows you to summarize into buckets. So what it's doing now is it's taking all the aggregate functions, sorting them and creating buckets. So for, once again, and she's not here, so I can't make fun of her this week, the ones doing surveys. And often when you're doing totals for surveys, you will sort the survey results into separate bins. And essentially what's happening in this case is it's creating a bin called city. It's finding each city. And then it's going to do the min, the max, and the average for each of those cities. Which is kind of cool. Uh, you can put in multiple buckets if you want. And of course that further subdivides everything. Uh, totally not unexpected. There are other limits to this, but that's essentially how the aggregates work. Um, you cannot use an aggregate in the WHERE clause. And here's why. The aggregate happens after the WHERE selection. So you go select star from retail orders. Fantastic. WHERE order date is on such such a thing. What it'll do is it will go and grab everything that's on that order date and then it'll do the aggregates once it's figured out what it's supposed to sort through. 
However, if you include the aggregate function in the WHERE clause, the aggregate function hasn't happened yet because it hasn't filtered down what it's supposed to pull. Yes, there is a way to do that, which I'll demonstrate in a bit, but you cannot use an aggregate function in a WHERE clause. It's just not how it works. Um, so, Actually, you know what? I don't even remember reading this slide. I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, essentially, what it's saying is it's you're doing it's doing some math, checking to see if it's not equal to the extended price, and it's returning nothing. Um, I guess that's the sanity check. Anyways, I'm going to skip this one because, yeah. Um, so, with the aggregates. There's also other functions called concat, and th these slides are in all kinds of in random order, aren't they? You know what, I'm going to finish talking about the aggregate functions by demoing it, and then I'll keep going through the slide deck. I have some feedback for whoever designed these slides today. You know what's worse, I actually looked through them really quick too, because I was getting the exam ready. And I'm like, I skimmed through them, I'm like, yeah, yeah, this makes sense, this makes sense, and I'm actually trying to do it in front of the class, it makes no sense, uh, the order. Okay. So, so far I've shown you how to group by. I've shown you min, max, and average. Um, there is one other clause. Remember just a minute ago I was talking about how you can't use the aggregate in a where clause? Because the math has not happened yet. The math happens after the record has been selected and cleared. Well, what happens if you still want to reduce the results coming out? Maybe, you know, in this case I want to have anything that the elevation is, the average elevation is only in a certain space. There is an extra clause at the end called having. All right, so having comes after the word group by, just so you know. And the way this is hap working is it'll do s the select from the airports, it'll be all grouped by city, after that result set's been reduced, it will then apply the having and filter it one last time. Having is to filter based on the results of an aggregate function. So in this case it's saying any city that has an average of elevation between 100 and 200 because there are a few city airports where there's actually a significant difference between the lowest airport and the highest airport. Um, this will let me do that. So if I run this, you will see now that everything has an average between 100 and 200. Anything less than 100 and higher than 200 average is being excluded. As you can see, this looks just like what we had in the WHERE clause. You can use um, typical math in here too, where I could go um, less than 100. That would also work. And I could also go As you can see, I can now operate multiple, just like in a WHERE clause, except this is where you do the filtering based on the aggregate function instead. It's not that complicated. If you can figure out how to use a WHERE, you can you figure out how to use HAVING, but you just have to remember HAVING has to do with the aggregate function, WHERE has to do with reducing it before you apply the aggregate. So WHERE reduces what you're operating on, HAVING operates on what's left. And I've also seen cases where people go, but I can write my where clause in my having clause. And yes, yes, it'll work. I could theoretically do this. Oh, 
Oh, it didn't like it. Well, there you go. My skill is actually doing something right. Uh, other database engines will actually let this work. I'm not a fan of it, but other database engines will let you do it. There's a surprise for Dan. Didn't expect that to blow up in my face. Um, for example, if you did this in Postgres or Oracle, that would have worked. Oh, you know what? If I do this, oh no, that's not a, that's not redo. I wonder what this is going to do for me. Absolutely nothing. Yay, I'm trying to get fancy. And it didn't, oh, that's because there's 100 over at the end here. There you go, that worked. So apparently in MySQL you have to include one of the display columns so it works in the having. So that was what I was trying to do a minute ago. Um, this just what happens in this case that you need to have it included. So for those of you that are wondering what just happened, is this couldn't work because it was not included in the results. So as if I were to take this line right out, it operates on what's found in the column names. That's what it's doing. Okay, so that takes care of aggregates, group by, and having. There is one other gotcha, and that one I won't show you how to fix until next week. However, I will demonstrate it today because it's a really important one. Okay, the human lizard brain sees this as going, this should work. I want to know what the average total elevation is by city. And you'll get a totally useless error message. Everybody at the back can't read this, but it's saying error code 1111, invalid use of a group function. Um, in a other database engine, such as Postgres and Oracle, it'll actually return an error, f an error message that says, cannot use nested aggregate functions. Here's why. The aggregate function operates on the result set. So the, f the inner aggregate will work just fine. The problem is that by the time the outer one happens, there is no result set left to operate on. There is a way to do this, and I will show it to you guys next week because that's part of next week's topic. However, there is a way to do it. So yes, I've had to do stuff like this in the past, and I felt really dumb the first time I tried to do this because you know what, when I was in college, they never taught us that this was a bad thing. They talked about aggregates, but they only ever talked about a single aggregate at a time. They never thought, you know, some dumb dumb like Dan's going to try to put an aggregate on top of an aggregate because he wants to know the average uh, sales total by month for the last three years. So to me, my math was I add up the day at the monthly sales, average that broken down by month, and voila, no. Um, you're not allowed to do that. And it's just because of the way the data is processed that once a single aggregate's been run, it cannot operate on the results of that aggregate because the, the time of doing aggregates is now done. So it does the math, stops, and it goes, oh, you got another piece of math, but you know what? I've already done the math. I don't want to do math anymore. It's a bit, a bit pretty much how some of you feel about your math classes when you hit the magic moment. If I've done some math today, I don't want to do math no more. It's pretty much the same effect, but you know, the SQL version. Okay, now to get back to this. Um, there is string functions, and there's a bunch of useful string functions. Um, concat is a common one. Uh, concat stands for concatenation or concatenate. And did you guys learn that in Java yet, what concatenation is? String one plus string two equals bigger string, right? Same idea, MySQL is extra special. You have to do it using a function. And you go concat column 
or string, comma, column or string, comma, column or string ad infinitum. I'm sure there's a limit how far you can go, but essentially it'll take anything that's being fed inside the concat and glue them together. And that one I will demonstrate right now, because that one's an easy one to demonstrate. You know, it helps if you actually spell it right. Okay, so I am, and it's really hard to see at the back, I know, sorry guys. I'm taking the city, sticking on a space, taking on the time zone name. So now the output is a single column, city, space, time zone name. That's what concat does. It just basically, it's just, I think if I remember it in Java, it's actually plus. Variable plus variable plus variable. In, you know, JavaScript, it's the same idea. Other languages, it's different. PHP uses a period. Um, Python, I think, uses a plus. Because you're adding one string to another. I guess. But it said that's concat. So... There's a few other useful functions. There's rtrim, ltrim, and trim. They all do the same thing, just they operate on a different spot of the string. rtrim removes empty white space on the right. ltrim removes empty white space from the left. So does anybody want to take a guess what regular trim does? It clears out both. So if you want to make sure your data is nice and clean and that nobody's done anything stupid, trim it. By the way, you should never ever trim someone's password. Because some people use spaces in their passwords as their, you know, non-alphanumeric character. And I know someone that used to put a space at the end and their password just stopped working once they were trying to log in to a certain website. Because the website was actually trimming spaces off the person's password. So, yeah, that's trim. And um, some unknown reason, now we're going to talk about the grouping that I just, there's everything I just demonstrated a minute ago. So this slide's definitely in the wrong spot. I'll be, you know, putting feedback about that. Um, actually, this, this uh, example's not that bad. It kind of shows a bunch of th different things. It's counting SKUs, displaying a department from a table, um, it's checking where the catalog page is not null. It's grouping by the department name where there's more than at least, there's at least two in each SKU. So that's what this one's doing. It's actually a really good example, just in a really bad spot in the slide deck. Um, but I just demonstrated all of these <laughs> earlier. So, okay. So there's a few basic rules of uh, operation here when it comes to grouping. Um, as I said earlier, the WHERE clause specifies which rows will be used to determine the groups. So WHERE clause filters out what it's going to operate on first. So it's basically going through the pile, finding everything that matches the rules, sets them aside. On the other hand, the HAVING clause specifies which groups and or aggregate functions are going to be used to output. So the where limits what's being worked on, having limits what's being output. And in general, place the where before the group by. Some database products do not require that placement. Um, I wish whoever wrote those slides had told me which one because I've never seen one that lets me do it in any order I want. I can guarantee that MySQL, Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, DB2, and Teradata all want it in that order where you have where, group by, having, order, by. You know what? Just do it that way. 
That way you'll never have a surprise of why it suddenly doesn't work. Just don't get into the bad habit of doing things in the wrong order. Um, and sometimes the where and the having clause will cause ambiguity to happen when it's trying to figure out what to do. So as a rule of thumb, the SQL interpreter will always do where before having. Why? Because having has to do with the aggregate functions, whereas where is to limit what's happening, so it'll always do the where first and then the having. Um, as I said earlier, you can group, you can order by more than one column, you can also group by more, more than one column. It's not that much of a mystery. Um, essentially, it creates bins, so it'll do you create all of bin 1, subdivide into bin 2, and then do the math on that. And this is where, you know, again, this is in the wrong spot. That should be like five slides ago. But remember I was talking about how MySQL is special where, you know, I can put in a column in the select statement and it just goes bruh. That's okay. I'm just going to assume I know what you want. I even though it's assuming completely wrong. Basically, it's saying that if you have a display column in your query, it should always be part of the group by. My, like I've said, MySQL is the only database engine I've ever seen that allows you to do this. Either the, whoever wrote MySQL decided that, you know, they assumed that the developers are going to be extra smart, or they just assumed that the developers couldn't be dumb enough to do it. It's one or the other. And I will, again, demonstrate if I were to go star, comma, city, comma, time zone name from airports, group by time zone name, comma, city. And I run it. So, It'll show that I'm counting how many, um, basically how many airports are in any given city in time, time zone. So it'll, figure, it'll first do all the math on the time zone, then do the math on the city. Uh, just to prove to you that it actually is working. Now. In London, England, there's 18 airports. Well, we all know by now that this table is just as in airports. There's also, you know, bus stations and train stations. But we're going to say there's 18 airports in London, England. Um, 14 in New York, 12 in Hong Kong, 11 in Berlin, 10 in Paris, and downwards from there. So because I'm grouping by extra columns, it's going to reduce the amounts. If I were to take out the city completely out of this, and I'll be a nice citizen and take it out of here too, just for argument's sake, now you can see that broken down by time zone, America and New York has the most airports for the time zone name. Before, what it did is they broke it down by time zone first and then subdivided by the local city. In this case, I'm only doing it as one bucket. So that's the you know, group and grouping by more than one thing. And this slide is an all-in-one slide. This slide shows you everything since, yeah, since last week and this week put together in one place. So if you're trying to find a slide as a reference point, this is the one. And, you know, I'm not going to see if there's anything wrong with this slide. It's actually a perfectly good slide. Um, so... It's showing that we're selecting multiple columns. We're applying an alias. We're doing an aggregate. We're grabbing from one table. We're saying, give me anything where the SKU is not whatever that number is. We're going to group the total by the department, wherever, and then it's going to say where there's at least two or more items in the SKU. And then we're going to finally sort out by this. And you may notice that the way they did it here is slightly different than what I did. When you sort at the end with order by, you can either sort by the aggregate function or by the alias. 
And there is an advantage to doing it with the alias. Does anybody want to take a guess what the advantage would be? Although for most people, they never notice it. Come on, I want to see some steam. Grey goo melting out of the ears. Come on. Why would it be an advantage of using an alias here instead of the way I did it? Instead of this. Eh? Yes and no. Yeah, that's not a bad reason. Uh, but that's not the, good re the real reason. It's, it's a valid reason. I'm not going to say it's wrong. It's a good reason, but it's not, it's a correct answer, but it's not the most correct answer. Yeah, sort of. So here it is. It added up the SKUs. It's given it a name. It's referring to the name. I added all the rows. Oh, wait, I'm going to add the rows a second time. It's doing the math twice. When you use the alias, it does the math once. Because you've already assigned it to something. Therefore, you're, it's saying, hey, I want you to order by something I've already added up. And by the way, here's its name. This does the math twice. Um, in, I know some database engines will realize that you're doing this math twice. And not do the second one a second time. It does some smart math in its head and it says, oh, by the way, I've already done this before, so I don't need to do this a second time. Um, I can guarantee that MySQL, um, SQLite, and Access definitely do the math twice. Um, I once had a system where I had to do, it had to be MySQL that was running on it, and I inherited it from someone else, and they wrote all their queries like this. And when I converted everything to actually use an alias here, um, I, I had about a 10% improvement, uh, performance improvement overall. Wasn't a huge uplift in performance, but, you know, 10% when operations would take, you know, 40 seconds is still a noticeable amount of time. You know, it's four seconds. And anybody in this room can tell you how long four seconds can feel. When you click the button and your computer's just thinking for a while, you know that last four seconds? Feels like four minutes. So this slide shows you the absolute best way to do all these things that we talked about today. So it's a good thing. And that was the last slide. It's a good thing the last slide was actually a good slide, eh? Okay. And I've already done all the little demos for today that goes with today's content, which is great. Now. The topic nobody's going to be happy to listen to. Okay. Under assignments, somewhere, there it is. And we can ignore assignment one. Down in assignment two. In assignment two, again, you're going to be working in groups. Um, I'm going to be doing submissions slightly differently than Sandra did. I'm actually going to use Brightspace properly. And I'll be creating uh, a group submission area. So what's going to happen is you are going to put your group together. You will email it to me. I will create a group for you where you'll be able to submit your work. That does two things for Dan. Because I'm not doing it for you guys. I'm doing it for me. I grade once, and it gives the grade to all the students in the group in one go. I don't need to remember the grades for each person and have to look them up and add them up and copy the comments across. You all get the same grades. Two, I won't have some cases like happened with the first assignment where every group member decided to submit the assignment. So suddenly I'm like, why is this the same? Are these guys plagiarizing? Oh no, they're part of the same group. It saves duplicates to, for me, so it makes my life easier in general. It'll make, it will make Alem's life easier also. So, anything that makes our lives easier makes your lives easier. Um, just take my word for it. All right, so assignment two, um, 
there was two flavors of assignment two. I chose to go with the one that's simplest for pretty much everybody. Um, there's two versions where you're going to take your design from assignment one and apply it in assignment two. And then I remembered how interesting some of those assignments were. And I decided I shouldn't submit my students to that, having to, to work with their own stuff. So I've added um, a diagram you guys are going to be doing. So I'm giving you guys a diagram. So this, picture this as being basically lab six plus lab seven, eight and nine as one submission. It sounds like a lot, but it's an assignment, right? So right now you have everything you need to do, well, lab six, obviously, lab seven, and as after today's lecture, you have everything you need for lab eight. Next week's lecture will give you lab nine. So as it stands, you have everything you need for 90% of this assignment. So you'll be able to start working on it, and after next week's lecture, you should have the rest. There was a reason I wanted my labs in a certain order, and this is why. So what's going to happen is I'm going to give you guys a diagram, and when you look at it here, and I love the way Brightspace operates, you can't actually see the diagram, so let me just uh, go into the assignment itself. And if you look at the end, you'll see uh, two attachments. One's the PDF version of the assignment, so in case you just want to download a copy of the PDF, because that's how you roll. And the other one is the diagram you're going to do. Now, yes, it's a larger diagram. You're not working on it by yourself unless you can't get a group member. Therefore, yeah, everybody's going, oh my, this is a big diagram. I cut out half of it. Okay? It used to be significantly larger than this. As you can see, look at the last update date in the corner. In case you can't read that, that's today. I pulled up this diagram going, I really don't like the way this was going to go, so I'm going to give you everybody the same assignment. And I dated it today after I ripped out about half of the tables. It's not that much work. Well, fine, it's work, but it's also an assignment. Right? So what are you going to do with it? This should sound fairly similar. You're going to create some DDL commands to create all the tables and the relationships. You will be graded on. Did you follow the same names? That's what's in the diagram. Ahem. Are you actually following the same case letter-wise as what's in the diagram? Did you cr use the same data types? Did you set up the relationships? DDL, right? Lab 6. Basically, it's lab six all over again, just twice as much content. Then I will have you doing test data. I'll, you should populate most of the tables. You don't have to populate all the tables. Obviously, I know there's a lot of tables in this. However, you have to be able to populate enough of the database to be able to finish the assignment. Um, there are some really cool websites you can use to generate data for yourself. Uh, one's called generatedata.com. I use it all the time uh, when I need to generate test data because it lets you to generate realistic looking test data. So you're going to generate some test data. And the way it's going to work is I'm going to give you guys a total of 17 points. Okay? Um, two points for the comment block because you should have a comment block saying, you know, I don't need a comment on every line. Please don't do that. I just want the comment block at the top saying, you know, insert statements, go here. Ten points for functional insert statements and five points for data coverage. In other words, did you populate? Now here it says, i.e. populated all the tables. Obviously, this is a big diagram, so it won't populate all the tables, but you've got to populate most of the tables. Uh, the functional insert statement says, I'm going to run your script. I'm going to take a point off from, uh, for every error. And I'm going to be telling LM to do the same thing. So one point off for every runtime error. It's like in your Java class. Would you hand in an assignment that doesn't compile? 
What are the odds the prof would go past zero for that assignment? Gets the assignment, hits run, it blows up. Prof says, well, that was easy. Um, so that is that one. The last one is very similar to labs 7, 8, and 9. There is 11 queries. You will provide a file with all 11 queries. And this is where, you know, from one group to the other, there should be a somewhat variation because you might search for something different. You might um, generate your test data differently, so that means the results will be different. Um, and the queries are, you're going to pull all the columns from a table. Select star from insert table here. Um, one, a query that displays a subset of columns, you know, select column one, comma, column two from table. Okay, this sounds like lab seven, right? That's basically step one and step two of lab seven. Um, and after that, it gets a little more complicated where there is a single clause, multi-clause where um, at number five, we are basically, number five is next week's lecture topic. Joins, not joints, joins. I once had a student in my class that says, but you keep saying the word joint. No. Apparently, you're projecting. So, five and six have joins. Seven, eight, nine are aggregates. So, technically, you'd be able to do seven, eight, and nine. Um, Eleven is a subquery, which is in the same topic as joins. And eleven. Eleven is an er, it's a kitchen sink query where you're going to have a join, you're going to have an aggregate, you're going to have a group by. Just to demonstrate that yes, you know. And what you will submit, so the grading for that one, um, you also need to create a view, which is going to be taught right at the end. I'm probably going to do a quick talk about views before the end. Um, if next week's lecture goes nice and quick, I'll probably move up the last lecture so that you guys have absolutely everything you need. Um, so the way the queries that wor it works is you get three points for every query. And again, two points for the comment block. Do you notice I'm actually giving you guys free points in this? Put the comment block at the top with your name. I give you two points. I'm generous. It's because I'm really savage when it comes to taking points off for errors. So, you know, I got to give you some points somewhere. Okay. Now, the way the points are broken down is as follows. One, you gave me a query. That actually lines up with, you know, Question, query number one, you gave me a query. Query number 11, you gave me a query for number 11. You get one point if it runs. I mean, I take it, I run it, I don't get an error. There's your second point. You've now passed that item. Third point, does it actually do what I asked? <laughs> because with SQL, unlike Java, Sometimes you'll write queries that work just fine that do not answer the question at all. Why? Because you did a group by in the wrong order. You did an order by in the wrong order. Your where clause is a little wonky, so you're not getting the exact results. So you get a point if you gave it to me. You, gave me, you get a point if it runs. You get a point if you got it right. So there's your three points for the queries. Um, the views, which I'll be talking about I'm hoping next week I'm going to move it up just to give it give you guys all the pieces you need. Um, is you're going to give me a file common block once again. There's your happy two points at the top, and then it's not worth a lot of points anyways. It's worth um, six points. So the views is the least of where the points are in this assignment. Um, so the grand total number of points is 75 points. So we're scoring you guys out of 75. 
And um, you can see how the points are broken down. And I think I need to go check my math because something's not adding up in my head. Um, so again, you guys are going to form your groups. You don't have to be the same group members as you had the first term. And thanks to uh, Blues Fest COVID, it might be a little rough finding team members for the next week. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, that will be due in a, um, literally the last week of the term. I'll, the due date should be showing up. If it doesn't, I'll make sure it's up by tomorrow. Um, what else is happening right now? I am currently uh, working on the final draft of the final exam. Just so you know, I'm the one writing the final exam. <laughs> I'm making sure there's tons of scenario questions. I'm kidding. But there are a few scenario type questions. It only covers everything from week nine on. Like everything before the break is not going to be on the exam. We're doing a split exam, right? You we're tested for one stuff, you were evaluated, it's gone. Everything from week nine onwards. Uh, currently it sits at 50 questions. Multiple guess Scantron. It's on paper. It's closed book, closed laptops. All of the students from all three sections are going to be writing at the same time in the same room. In the gym. <laughs> okay. Yeah, almost. Not the nice gym. The gym at the other end there in B building. You know where the, the volleyball team plays? There. So. That will do more details about the exam later, but as you can expect, you come in with your pencils, your erasers, and your brains. And that is it. If you have accommodations, please tell me well ahead of time. Because you're going to have to book with Cal. The final exam schedule, I don't know, has shown up on Access yet or not. Um, actually, let me go check. What? Oh, it's because I have two different exams. <laughs> For a second, I thought they had me and uh, they had to split. It's the bottom one right there. Hang on. August 17th at 4 p.m. in the gym. Be there, or be square. Or, you know, being Cal. Whatever works for you. Yes? I shit you not. No. There's going to be 300 of you guys sitting together in a room writing an exam on paper. And you'll be, at least, I guarantee I'll hear tears at least once. Because every time I've proctored an exam in the gym, you always hear one person going. <laughs> <laughs> um, my exam is being proofread by a 22-year-old, also a student at Algonquin, but not in this program. Why? I wanted their perspective on how bad these questions were. She is not familiar with the topic, but she can sure as heck tell me if the, ter the questions are terrible. I've been doing a lot of revisions. So, you know, if nothing else, it should be understandable by you guys by the time she's done with it. Uh, I've already had to revise the exam four times. So, yeah, so it'll be 50 questions, Scantron. Uh, I think they're booking us for like an hour and a half, which is very generous for 50 questions. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's that, guys. Today's lecture is done, nice and quick. All the information you need to be shared amongst you is, has been shared. Um, I'll see some of you in next week's lab. <laughs>